It was in 1987 when I was 12 years old. This is when my village in South Sudan was attacked. It was attacked in the middle of night. My mother was calling outside saying, meet, meet Bakbe. That's a Dinka statement, children, children, get out. As we got out, I saw somebody running across my home compound I thought it was my father. I ran after that man in that middle of night. He dashed into the grass. Later I came around and grabbed my right arm and pulled me into the grass. The long line, would, line of troops were coming, shooting, burning down our houses, looting our cows, raping women, abducting young girls to be taken to northern Sudan to become their concubine. It was a total destruction that night. The guy that I thought was my father turned out to be my neighbor. That's when I was separated from the rest of my family. In the following morning, I was with him. We were going toward east from my village to, to the next country, which was of course Ethiopia. It took us about three months to get there on bare foot, wearing nothing, eat nothing. We only live on wild fruits like birds chewing grass like a cow. We went for many days along the way being attacked by wild animals. We ran into some of the lost boys. We started out with two of us. Later we were five. Almost in the middle there we were 19. By the end we were 27 lost boys. At night very cold, I only pray to the Lord, God please make, make the night go away because the night is real very cold. In the morning, in the daytime is good. To find water, we could listen to the, to, the, to the sound of frog making noise. We know that there will be water there. Along the way, uh, some of the boys died because of starvation and of course of thirst as well. I still remember between a place called Pibor and Pochala, we had no water. We went for almost two days with no water. It was desperation. People are crying. They don't want to go. You are on your own. We did things like to try to save each other by having one urinate and then somebody else drink it. That did not even work out either. By the time we find good water, we were only four of us survived. We lost 27 boys. Before we get into Ethiopia, only four of us walking, we, we found that, we heard that the local people, Anyuak, kill an elephant. We went there, I went there. They gave me kind of a meat like this, round came and cook it with, with no knife. We cook it and wait and wait when it, when it could not really cook. And so we got it out. I was stronger than those three. So I had them trying to bite it. They could not do it. So I did it, I bite and, and take it from my mouth, give it to that person. I did that. And then once they eat, then I add mine. In the United States, when somebody drinks from a cup, you say, who drank from this cup? But we shared things from our own mouths to help each other. Later, we came to this place called Penya de Rabaji Camp, which we call our, our home. We were put in a group of 50 as a family. We lost families. We met our own families. I was 12 years old, but I was taller than the other boys. I was picked to become a leader of one group. Later, they add some boys into my group. My group became... 1,200 boys, their age were from age five to age 15. These boys are crying every day. They want to drink milk, they want to eat food, they want to see their mothers. There is nothing I and other boys could do. We only lied to them that today is bad, tomorrow will be better. The United Nations, the World Food Program, all the other agencies came, they heard about us, they start bringing some, some more food. Diseases such as cholera, typhoid, wolfing cold, measles, chicken fog were killing boys every day. I remember in my own group about two, two or three boys dying every day. So we can take the bodies of brothers and sisters, so we can give them some sort of dignity by burying them there. If we, can, if we come back the follow, uh, following morning, we could find the bodies of those we buried the previous day eaten by wild animals. That was a very graphic part of our life story. We didn't give up. Four years later, you know, the United Nations agencies came with secondhand clothes. Maybe they brought them from the United States or from Europe. When you get the bottom part, somebody else will get the top. At least you wear something. They brought more food. Our life was getting better a little bit. But that did not work, did not stay that way. 
we were then forced out of that place in Ethiopia, went back to South Sudan. The number of the lost boys and girls and some adults, we became 27,000. And we're moving back to South Sudan. We stopped at a place called Gilo. Gilo is a river infested with a lot of crocodiles in it. If you have watched National Geographic channel where you can see animals crossing rivers in Africa and the crocodiles go and grab them, that was something was, that a, was about to happen to us. Some did not know how to swim. We were banking, uh, you know, camping uh, on the bank of the river. Figured out there's no way to cross. All of a sudden, the troop from the government of Ethiopia sent after us, start shooting at us, start di diving into the water, some eaten by crocodiles, others lost, others drowned, others captured. I was one of the luckiest person, of course, including others. Those who crossed the river went to the other side to a place called Pochala, it was controlled by Sudan people, liberation army. These are people that are fighting the north, and they help us, they welcome us, we all ran out of food. The few clothes that were given to us by United Nations agencies would start selling them for food. We put our clothes together, we can sell your shirt today, tomorrow we can sell your pan or something like that until we all sold our clothes, we all remain naked. We're being bombed every, every day in the morning, in the afternoon by the Sudan government sent a Russian made aircraft known as Antonov and to no bombers each day. We decided to move to the interior part of South Sudan to a place called Kapoita. Along the way there, some of us were abducted, some killed, some died because of starvation. We, we, I, I, of course, survived, made, made it to that place. We stayed there, we were then attacked, then we crossed into another country called Kenya. Coming to Kenya was good because the Kenyan government would not allow Sudanese troops to cross into their territories. And what was good for coming to Kenya was that there was a, a refugee camp there. They helped us, and then they started education. This is where I start to learn A, B, C, D, one, two, three, at the age of 17. Our classes were under trees, sitting on the dirt, using my finger as a pencil. It was good. We, we, we were learning. Because education, there's something we thought, education is my mother and my father. So we kept learning until 1999, when I was in my 11th grade, we were told that the Americans are here. It's my first time to see an American. And the way they look at that time, the tall guys with the long noses, you know, when they speak, they speak as if they're speaking through their noses. And what they were telling us is that they would take us to the United States. Well, in the year 2000, and they, they came back, and they take, we will take you. They start doing paperwork. They start taking some of the lost boys to Nairobi. Nairobi is the capital city of Kenya. Now we say, that is true. We're going to go to America. And now, topic about America is a better word. People think they know America. Others were saying, you know, if you go to America, it's okay to be lazy in America. Because if you are lazy in America, the American people will tie something called green card around your neck. And you just show up at any restaurant, and you just eat for free, you know? <laughs> I say, that is the country I want to go. <laughs> while, I, while others were saying, you know, if you go to America, America have this better good technology. If you go to any restaurant in America, you don't need somebody to serve you. There is some big table there. On the top of those tables, there are some button on the top. There's chicken button, there's a beef button. <laughs> so if you want to eat chicken, you just push chicken button and chicken coming rolling from nowhere, you know? <laughs> I said, that is a country I want to go. <laughs> While others were saying, you know, John, be very careful when you go to America, the American girls are crazy. <laughs> and Daniel explained and said, how crazy they are. Every girl in America, they carry small bags. And he said, do you know what is in those bags? I said, no. He said, they have guns in it. <laughs> So, so if you mess up with American gold, they will shoot you, you know? I say, this is a country where you, you, you have this chicken button and women are killing people, what am I gonna do, you know? <laughs> While my name came out of the board, say, John, now you're going to Syracuse, New York. I was so happy, I'd say, you know what? I'm gonna go to, um, to America, but it's because of girls, I'll stay away from American girls, you know? 
I was flown to JFK and then to Syracuse. There were people, about 14 people from our church waiting for us outside. And three of us, I was ahead of the three. We merged out of the corridor. I ran, one of them ran up to me and said, John, welcome to America. I think they knew we were from Africa, very black and skinny. They knew that we came from that place. <laughs> and they were nice people. They hugged us and we hugged them. And, and so it was really good. But there were four girls there, you know. <laughs> I didn't want to go and hug those girls. I may mess them up and kill me. So I stayed away. <laughs> anyway, they took us to, a, to our apartment, which actually took them the entire day for running out through what is called orientation to show us this, this is how you turn on light. I didn't know how to turn on light. This is how you turn on light. This is, how, this is cold water, this is hot water, refrigerators and all of this. But before they go home, they, before they go to Skinny Alice, they say, John, let, let me take you to, to see uh, a grocery store and maybe show you how to, to buy your groceries. I said, okay. So three of us, we went there, there were two women there, we were following them, and I gotta tell you, we came to this giant's grocery store, and was, as we kept coming closer to it, a magic door opened itself like this. <laughs> I was amazed, you know. Do you know what I was thinking? I say truly the American people may be better lazy, and that's why they don't, they, they created <laughs> automatic doors. But I didn't want to tell them. I thought if I tell these women, they would shoot and kill me. So, <laughs> so we went inside this grocery store. That's really, I cannot believe that people so wealthy, they have so much in one grocery store. And even I came across of dog food and a cat food aisle. So I said, this is really wealthy, where the animal owned their aisles. <laughs> So inside there, so, you know, so people have been, uh, been helping us. Our three month finish that I call our honeymoon. When you're coming to uh, New York State, you are held for three months. When honeymoon finish, finish. Then we were on our own. They, you know, my first job at McDonald's, grilling hamburgers, doing ditches. I work at security guard. I work at UPS, three jobs or two jobs sometime. But then I said, you know what? This job are not going to take me anywhere. I must go to school. I enroll at Onondaga Community College, finish my associate degree in 2005, and then transfer to Syracuse University, Maxwell School of Citizenship, and then I finish my bachelor degree. But then I said, hey, here I am. I came with nothing. I came with no shoes. I came with no bag. And the America, the country have helped me I'm not here really to just take. I must also give back. And this is when my work started, my humanitarian work started. I started with the Lost Boy Foundation of New York. That organization became 5133. I raised about $35,000 for the Lost Boy in Syracuse. I stepped down from that organization. Then I formed American Care for Sudan Foundation. I raised about $180,000. And then I said, you know what? I want to do something back in South Sudan. I want to build a clinic. And then we start the clinic, we build the clinic, I uh, you know, form my third organization, John Duff Foundation, and my fourth organization called American Care for Sudan Foundation and, and, South, and South Sudan Institute as well. So I ended up forming four nonprofit organizations. That clinic that we built in 2007, since that time, we have treated over 150,000 people. We, with the help of... With, with, the help, with the help of the, these great Americans, I mobilized doctors from Utah, from Montana, from Syracuse, New York. I took them to South Sudan, and they did eye surgery for 600 people who are completely blind. We have been doing, I have been very successful in the work that we are doing. Right now, we have four clinics that are operating inside South Sudan. I raised over four million dollars to build those and, and run those clinics. I was able to bring my mother to the United States, my sister to America. I have two books called God Grew Tired of Us, published by National Geographic. My wife and I, we co-wrote a book called Lost Boy, Lost Girl. Some of you might have watched 
God Grew Tired of Us, documentary that was narrated by Nicole Kidman. I have been very successful in the things that I've been doing. Now, let me get your attention a little bit. Do you really think, now I start talking about success, what I have done, do you really think I'm here to show off? I am not. I am not here to show off. If you have been listening to the first part of my life story, it was very graphic. I have consumed things that I will never forget. I drank human urine. I ate mud. I chewed grass like a cow. I, ate, I only live on wild fruits like a bird. I never knew that I was going to survive. I have buried so many boys at that young age. You know, I have done things, you know, things that really, the, the, the reason I survived was not because I was so smart. The reason is, is because of Almighty God. God have helped me. The second, the second reason is, I did not give up. And so why is it that in this community of Richmond, sometimes all of us, when we are faced with a tough time, we tend to give up very quickly. So why? Why can we really push on and push on a little bit by a little bit? Look at me. In suit, and most of the time, I was very, there, there was nothing that I was wearing in my life. When I came to the United States, I never owned, owned belt. I never owned things. I came with an empty hand, with nothing. So that, why is it sometimes when we are faced with a tough time, we tend to give up better quickly? Here's what I have to sh will share with you. You know, I say to myself, success and struggle is a package. You can never want to be successful and you don't want to, 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 to struggle. Please, sometimes people say, well, I was abused when I was young. I never had any parental care when I was young. And that actually made us to go back to our life and actually that prevented us from being successful. Leave behind what happened to you in, you, in your life and move forward. Don't let it hold you back. Please, when you become successful in your life, give back to your community. And the community of Richmond is your community. God bless you. Thank you very much.